your pants because we're going to learn about computer safety now. So we talked about what computer security is and the next iteration is now look at what is actual computer safety. So um, with security I showed you some examples where people purposely inserted errors into computers um, to cause you know some sort of negative effect. Typically there was some fraud incentive. Um, but the flip side of it, you know, and not the objective of this course, but also important to understand is the safety aspect. Um, so this is where you're not intentionally inserting errors into the computers, uh, but sort of, you know, the world itself is inserting errors into the computer. Um, and I'm going to do the same thing as I did before. I'm going to do this through a series of failures. So like before, I'm going to show you um, sort of an introduction to computer safety via what happens if you don't consider computer safety. Um, and so I'm going to do a number, there's sort of three main ones um, and then a few other links. There's actually quite a few good examples of computer safety failures out there, um, unfortunately. But these are some of kind of, I think, the most important in terms of um, engineering insight. So the first one also has a Canadian connection is a system known as Therac 25. Um, so if you haven't heard of this before, this is something that um, is uh, you know worth actually researching a bit. It's quite an interesting case study on why computer safety is so critical, right? So if you're designing any sort of computer system, um, this is sort of what can go wrong. So as a quick background, Therac 25 was a of radiation treatment machine, right? So radiation treatment, we use radiation um, to kill cells that we don't want in our body. Typically this is cancer or something like that that's being um, attacked with radiation. So uh, on this diagram here is your typical treatment room. So what you have is you have the unit itself. So you can see this big unit here um, is the Therac 25 unit. And there's a patient that lays down under it on a treatment table here and there have some um, alignment to uh, this machine itself. And now because of the radiation and everything, right, the operator isn't actually in the room. Um, the operator is typically behind some sort of shielded room um, where they're observing. So one of the, the things is that there may not be a, a direct uh, connection to the machine, so we need some sort of remote, uh, remote control to it. Um, so the Therac 25 uh, really quickly was kind of this, this revolutionary, this, this new design machine. Um, and it delivered two types of radiation to the patient. Uh, and the idea of this is that, you know, you have this one machine, so you have this really expensive machine that you need a special room and everything for. Um, but it could do two different types of treatments. So hypothetically, this is going to reduce the cost of the hospital because they only need the one type of, the one machine that can do two different tasks. Um, and you basically had two very different things that it could deliver. So on one setting, it was a low energy setting. Um, so it was delivering basically, uh, it had like an electron beam. Um, and this would be really good if you had shallow. So if you know, you know, you had tissue right at the surface that you wanted, um, to provide the radiation treatment to, um, in the other mode, it was a high energy mode and it used x-rays. Um, these will penetrate much, much deeper into the body. This is obviously a lot more dangerous. Uh, but if you had something like you had lung cancer you're trying to attack, um, you need this, this mode to attack into the body like that. In order to provide these different modes, um, you basically have this turntable. So this diagram here is showing a portion of the machine. And this machine's like a disc, right, that can rotate. Um, and you can see that there's sort of, so that this is the center of the disc here. Um, and there's two, two important modes here. There's this electron mode scan uh, magnet. So in electron mode, basically there's magnets around it. We have this, this weak electron beam that we focus in with the magnets. Um, in the other mode here, there's uh, x-ray mode. So it's a, a totally different, um, um, a totally different target mode that we need here because uh, we're not using the magnets to focus it. We have some other aperture in the way here. Um, also notice that there's uh, a, a third one that says mirror here. And what this mode is, is this actually isn't designed to deliver any, so it doesn't have any blocking or anything uh, at all. Um, it has a mirror that basically this will reflect light down so that if, as you're aligning the patient, you can see where one of these invisible electron or x-ray beams should be. 
Um, and all there is, is there's basically this switch assembly that kind of tells the computer what mode um, this particular turntable is in. So the thing can turn, uh, you have to make sure it's aligned correctly, right? It has to be perfectly aligned with the beam. Um, and because the machine supports these different modes, right? The only difference is what disc is aligned in front of it. And the correct, you know, the X-ray mode um, target has to be there if it's doing X-ray modes. Likewise, the electron, uh, mode has to be there with the magnets if it's trying to deliver uh, electron uh, therapy. So, so it was really critical that this disc also matched, you know, whatever the, it was being emitted by the machine itself because it's always coming out of the same uh, location. Um, so super critical to the operation. Um, the user interface, so remember I mentioned there is some sort of user interface, obviously. Um, it's based on, you know, now what would be quite a uh, old computer, but at the time, this is what made sense um, is this is basically what you had. So this is um, the computer interface you had, right? So you had a operator that would enter information about, um, for example, the, the expected rate. Um, you have a, a importance here is the beam type. So you have an E entered here, for example. Um, so it, you could either enter an electron beam uh, or an x-ray beam um, and it, it was just a difference of your x to, to switch between these modes um, and you had various other stuff that was coming out here and you know and some information about uh, other settings now basically what uh, happened is that there this did not work well so i mentioned you know you had to have the, this alignment it had to be in the right mode it, there was a number of software errors um, that basically meant what was displayed to the operator did not always match what the machine was actually going to do. Um, so we had what we'll call what we call race conditions, where uh, if you have a variable, right, one copy of the variable is being displayed, for example, and one copy is being used internally. Well, what if um, when we we write to them? You know, we write at different times to each one and therefore different values could be written in, into it uh, if this isn't done safely. So this is exactly what happened um, and it actually killed people as a result of this. So when we talk about computer safety, right, we're not just talking about monetary loss or something. There can be very serious consequences for this. Um, there was a huge number of issues. So this sort of uh, Therac 25 disaster really uh, became sort of the start of a lot of computer safety code uh, practices. Uh, but to give you a feel for how bad this is, right? Um, in previous versions of the machine, they actually had hardware interlocks that would prevent stuff from like the machine. So what the machine could do now is the machine could be um, in x-ray mode, but with the disc aligned in this electron mode or even in the mirror mode. So it, it had no protection um, against the the beam that was being delivered. So it was not correctly focusing the beam or anything like that anymore. Um, so this was done in, entirely in software. Um, so now we had pure software that previously was actually, the hardware was stopping it. So they removed the hardware safety measures without validating that the software measures were also working correctly. Um, we had really basic, so some of this also was, uh, you know, kind of, poor operator interface. Um, so we had stuff like malfunction 53 uh, that didn't explain what that meant. And there was tons of different malfunctions that would come up all the time. Um, you know, if there was little settings that were off or anything like that. And the operators just got used to, to hitting continue effectively, right? So they just hit continue and the machine kept running. Um, and it turned out that really critical errors like, oh, you're about to deliver uh, x-ray beam um, when the machine's configured for electron mode would give this similar error 53 and you could just skip it, right? So you don't expect the machine to do that. Um, so there was quite a few uh, errors in the design of this, right? And as I say, there are some good resources um, that you can dig into a little more. But that's kind of an overview of, um, you know, one of the first cases. So that was in about uh, 85. Now, if we jump ahead to something more recent, um, you might have heard of this, this Toyota unintended acceleration case. 
Um, so this one is interesting because uh, it's actually a little, so I have a, a note here at the bottom. Um, it's been quite sort of, a, I don't know, there's, there's people that don't believe it. There's people that um, think effectively uh, what happened. So the, the issue was that a number of cases came up where it seemed like some of these cars were basically sort of taking off, right? So they were accelerating um, and they wouldn't shut down. So there was a lot of claims that, you know, it's just people's foot got stuck in the accelerator or the floor mats getting stuck or something like that that's holding the um, this down and, you know, they forgot to break or, or things like that. So it sort of came to light more heavily when there was a case um, where a highway patrolman basically was on 911 um, saying his car wouldn't stop, he wasn't able to stop it, um, and he was trying different things with with no luck. So um, you'll note, so you'll you'll hear some people that do some like really basic tests, and I have this note at the bottom because uh, you know, it's always, always important to sort of try to validate what you you hear. So you can you can look up some of this if you want. Um, but one note, so when we talk about this, um, the cars uh, people often say, you know, if you put your foot on the brake and go full. Um, full gas, the car won't move because the brakes can always stop the car. Um, but if the car is on full throttle, so if you have a true full th throttle situation, a uh, brake assist is going to be lost. So your power brakes um, will not function because it relies on a vacuum. So a lot of cars will actually electronically back off from full throttle if you try to brake. Um, not all cars do this. So the, the Toyota cars that were implicated don't do this. So in theory, if you went absolute full throttle, so it has to be full throttle, not just partial or anything. Um, you'll lose the, the brake assist, which means you lose power braking. So your brakes still work, but they feel very, very stiff. So if you've ever uh, had a car that's died on you when you're driving, you know this feels very different. Um, so there's a lot of stuff out there uh, that you might, if you go to, to do look at some of this yourself, um, you might see some claims that you know don't actually hold up with, with what we can see. But what we're not actually going to talk about is, you know, whether or not there might be some people that actually did, did make a mistake or whatever. Um, what we can talk about is how these systems work. And we can actually look at, because there was a, a ton of work done via a court case, um, we can actually look at these ECMs. Now, there's a video I linked to you here that is from Toyota actually showing, you know, some of the fail safes they have in the sensors themselves and how if you disconnect them, the engine shuts down. Um, and basically the, the crux of how these systems work very basically is you have a gas pedal. So if you're driving your car, you're pressing the gas pedal. Most of the time what you're doing or all the time in modern cars, you are not physically connecting anything to the engine. You're just pressing a sensor. Um, that sensor will have a spring that makes it feel like, you know, it's hard to press it and things like that, but it's purely for, for your enjoyment. Um, this sensor goes to the engine control module and this engine control model goes to something called the throttle body um, and this throttle body basically opens this flap that tells um, that, that allows air into the engine as well as adjusting other settings um, so what you should see so i have a, another video here i'll pull up where i actually played with one of these so let's just look at that um, and what you'll see is basically um, in the left here, I have a sensor. And so this is the throttle position sensor. And on the right here, I have the throttle body. Um, and as I move this sensor, you can see this flap opening and closing. So this is the system working correctly. Um, and at the same time, it would be triggering ignition and stuff. So we don't really care about that too much. But you can see that as I move that, um, that sensor there, the throttle position was changing. Now, what's interesting is that if I insert, so I'm sort of, uh, you, you can see this in more detail if you're curious, um, but what I want to show you is I'm inserting faults into the device. So basically what's happening is um, as these device operates, they can get memory corruption and stuff like that. So I'm doing this on purpose now. Um, and you can see this thing is now stuck closed. Um, it's a bit off screen, but as I try to move this, um, it's no longer responding correctly. Right, so it seems like it's kind of crashed, but it hasn't fully because you can see it flapping, uh, flapping open at different points. So if you try to push your, your pedal, you can see it's suddenly going full throttle and, and back and stuff like that. So clearly we're into some weird state here, right? Um, which is odd, 
So it's not exactly that situation, but this isn't exactly the, the ECU in question. Um, and what's interesting, right, is that if you look at, so um, there's a really great presentation uh, by Michael Barr. He's given it at um, a few events, but there, you can see the slides online, basically. Um, and what this goes over is how, so he sort of reverse engineered some of this, how this actually works in real life. Um, and so what I just told you, right, is exactly this. We have an acceleration pedal sensor. Um, we have a throttle body. And there's basically this thingy here, right, that's called a control loop. And this, effectively, what it does is it controls the throttle as well as stuff like the fuel injection and everything else to command, you know, if you say, I want full throttle, it says, okay, open that up 100% of the way, um, you know, adjust all the engine timings and things like that. So it's it's not as integrated as you think. You basically set a, um, a throttle position and everything kind of else catches up to, to what you're doing with that. Um, what this means though, is that if you just command 100% throttle, you know, the engine can deliver that. Um, and it all kind of depends on a whole bunch of stuff going right. So what you can have, so what the, the theory was that um, was sort of shown in the design of this, is you basically have this situation where, you know, when you're designing this, you have the driver control as one input. Um, and this is one, what we call a task, right? So this is one task here that's reading this, the sensor and writing it to some variable. Um, the second thing here is we have this control loop that's actually controlling the engine. So now we have the engine control loop that's say set to 100%. Um, and that's fine, that's running, but what if this dies? So what if it no longer reads from the driver? It no longer reads whatever you're setting as the accelerator. Um, it's just gonna stick with that last value. So whatever you're at, it's just sticking with it. So the problem is if you were trying to pass someone, right, and you had the, the pedal down, um, it now thinks you just want 100% throttle and it's just giving you 100% throttle and it's not stopping uh, because the task that was reading what you're trying to do is now dead. Um, and because of this little artifact of um, the fact that if you have 100% throttle, stuff like your, your power brakes don't really work, um, becomes a huge issue because you can now if you're trying to break right it's not actually reducing the throttle it's still giving you 100 percent throttle um and it, it, it potentially has the potential to cause some of the effects we saw um, whether or not that 100 percent happened we can't know so this is the thing right we can't guarantee this is actually what happened um this was just a case that kind of showed you know was the the code designed as safely as it should be um, you could simulate it, right? So in this case, there was sort of a, a simulation here um, where uh, they killed the task. So they, they had this exact situation. You can see basically what happens is they kill the task here um, and the throttle basically gets stuck um, at the, um, the, the maximum. So it gets stuck at open throttle um, and what you can see is that it the car just keeps accelerating. So in the blue line here is the car acceleration, um, and the the car just keeps accelerating here. Um, and for some reason, so there's a note here that for this um, task, if the task dies while the brake is being pressed, uh, because the car can monitor the brake, because it's going to adjust stuff if you're trying to brake. Um, if the task dies during the brake application, uh, if you have your foot on the brake at all, it doesn't actually realize that the task has died until you remove it from the brake fully. So if you, by trying to brake, um, you actually trigger this really bad mode of the car. Um, so th this is, you know, again, did this happen in the cases in real life? We can't know. Uh, but the point is this seems like not very good software design. And what we're talking about is software safety. So we really care about um, how do we catch, you know, A, how did this happen? B, how do you prevent that? those sort of things. And how it happened, it's a massive number of failures. So, um, you know, I, I do really recommend checking out uh, the link I gave earlier to Michael Barr's presentation. Um, 
and you basically had like, you know, over here, there's uh, a watchdog timer, we call it, which is something that is basically uh, supposed to keep an eye on the task to see if they die. Uh, and because of how they implemented it, they basically implemented it in a way that guaranteed the watchdog was always running. Um, it did not detect the task and it in was in fact incapable of detecting, you know, that this had happened. So it could not detect this happened. It could not then recover the system. Um, and there was super complex code. So what we call spaghetti code, uh, there was tons of unsafe memory stuff. There's, there's a lot of stuff we're actually going to go into when we look at how systems can be exploited. Um, but the point is these were pretty well known errors. Um, so this is a pretty good example of a recent, you know, super high profile, incredibly expensive for Toyota. Um, even if there wasn't sort of a, a criminal result out of this, it's still incredibly expensive uh, for Toyota. Um, and the final failure I'll talk about uh, mainly is another recent one. Um, and this is kind of a more of a system failure, but it, it does fall under software because it turned out there was quite a few different software faults responsible for this. And that's probably one you might've heard of. Um, this is about the 737 MAX 8. So this is an aircraft um, that was an update of the 737-800. So this is the 737-800 aircraft here. Um, and what sort of happened is with the 7378, um, the objective was to have a larger engine and this engine wouldn't fit, right, where this engine is directly under the wing. Um, so because they were trying to use a, a larger engine, a more powerful engine, um, you, you had to move a few things around to get this to fit. And it's a small change, right, but it's more forward in this case, the engine's a little more forward um, than in the, the previous 737. So it slightly changes the flight characteristics. Um, and one of the important flight characteristics it changes is that as you're uh, accelerating um, or increasing the thrust on the engine, the, the aircraft's likely to want to nose up, right? So it wants to nose up. This is really bad because this can cause a, a stall, we call it, um, right? So the aircraft goes, it starts to climb too high, the speed over the wings um, is too slow and the aircraft can, can stall and, and basically fall. Um, so how do we fix that? Well, we fix it with software, right? So let's fix this hardware problem with software, classic type of thing to do. Um, and they use this max flight control uh, system, they called it MCAS, and it basically tries to prevent the stall from happening. Um, so what it's gonna do is it detects the nose up situation and it pushes the aircraft back down. Um, and it does all this via something called an angle of attack sensor. So there's a little sensor that tries to detect uh, sort of what angle the aircraft is relative to the airflow because this is the, the angle it's going over the wing and if this is wrong, then all sorts of bad stuff happens. Um, and the sensor looks like this. So it's basically a little weather vane almost right on the side of the plane. Um, the real problem came out because uh, there was only one of them on a lot of these systems. So uh, there's various options and versions and things like that. But several of the planes that had these issues just had a single sensor, a single point of failure. You know, this is always going to be a bad situation. So um, this is another case where we had, you know, a, a complex system driven by software and uh, choices around the, the software itself. And there were actually some other issues in the software, but fundamentally, right, this is not a system that can really be designed to be safety critical. Um, there's a few other failures you can research. So I, you know, looking again at software, um, kind of software and, and system failures, um, two space related ones. So space ones are interesting because they're really expensive technically. Um, so Excuse me, so Ariana 5 is a rocket that, let's see if I have that up here. Um, there's a rocket, this was in 96, um, and you can see that it starts to go off and then explodes. So this isn't, isn't what you want your rocket to be doing. Um, and what this one was caused by was incorrect unit conversion. So it was using a 64 bit type converts to a 16 bit type and then it, everything goes wrong in the navigation. 
Uh, Mars Climate Orbiter was a space probe that was lost, so like $330 million uh, cost. And this was like incorrect internal unit conversion. So one unit was assuming um, SI units, one unit system was assuming Imperial within the, the data actually being exchanged and it just caused a, um, a, a failure. So, so there's a, lots of other examples you can go through, but you can see that um, you know there's no shortage of human cost as well as obviously financial cost as well um, to these sorts of mistakes. And the, the reason I bring up all these and the reason I bring up, um, you know, a few that have caused uh, sort of loss of life first is because that's one of the important things. And we'll talk uh, briefly about ethics as well. But, you know, the safety of the public is one of the most important things to consider. Um, and the root causes of all of the previous ones, right, you can just say, well, it was the software errors, you know, they didn't do good practice. Um, the thing you have to remember is that a lot of these are good engineers, smart engineers doing it, right? So it's engineers who aren't familiar with the best practice. So it might be the case of people, you know, don't want to make a mistake. They just aren't familiar with what they should be doing. And they're asked to do something that's outside of the, the range of what they should actually do. Um, it might be management pressure to deliver. So another typical problem you see is that, you know, the, the people knew about some of these internally. And this was the case for... Um, you know, at least several of these, they're later turned out to be internal memos where engineers were unhappy with this or other people are unhappy with it. Uh, but there was just management pressure to go ahead anyway. Um, the other thing is there might be some blindness, right? So you may not actually know how the final system is used. Um, and it might be a case of like, ah, I'm sure someone else is, is solving it. So um, it's another thing where, you know, you have to be aware of where this is being used. If you're um, designing it and you're agreeing that no this is you know safe to use in this situation um, it, it, it shouldn't have an ability to use it in an unsafe way so if you're not validating the inputs in your own system um, you need to ensure that that input validation is part of the sort of like how thou must use this device so part of the specification really of the using of, of it um, so so far, we talked about failures, right? How do we design safe computer systems? Just knowing they can fail isn't very good. Uh, you probably want to fix them. Um, so this course is actually, you know, this whole course isn't about computer safety. Um, that's a, a huge course in itself, but I want to cover the basics of it. Um, and you probably have run across by now one of these, you know, I call it risk matrix thingy because you've probably used it in a bunch of different situations. Um, you've at least hopefully used it as part of like a project plan where you say, okay, well, here is uh, the probability of something happening and here is the severity. Um, so after the Therac 25 um, accidents, there's a, a standard actually on sort of um, safe coding uh, this IEC 61508. Um, one of the important parts of this is basically defining what the likelihood of some of these occurrences are in the consequence. So we have a likelihood of occurrence um, and rather than just having a very vague like, ah, it probably could happen, might happen, um, we actually have a, a failure rate of the system, right? So this is something that you should have some way to thus calculate. Um, and we have a, we can then categorize them into rate like frequent. So it's going to happen many times in the system life likelihood, um, up to something that it should almost never happen in the entire, you know, um, system life, a system, uh, lifespan or anything like that. So, um, the, the system lifespan, obviously, right, this is totally different if it's something that's designed to be run uh, for, you know, 10 minutes versus something that's designed to be run for um, 20 years. Um, so there's, there's some reason we include that system lifespan as well. Um, and we just have a, a consequence categories, right? So in this case, again, this was sort of designed after um, the results of Therac 25. So you notice that there's a, a definition really around like, um, cause of damage to people. So is it going to hurt or kill a single person, multiple people? Um, and we can categorize, you know, what are the consequences of um, that sort of failure. So in a similar way, we then combine these into a risk matrix. Um, in this case, you have a um, class of risk 
so you basically see class one is unacceptable in any circumstance, which basically covers, you know, if it's frequent, almost everything except um, minor injuries at worst right, is going to be totally unacceptable in every situation because it's very likely to happen. Um, on the flip side, if it's, you know, incredibly unlikely, um, there might be some, all of these risk categories could be okay. Um, and, and this is going to change, right? So you'd always have to make sure you're referencing uh, whatever the latest version of the standard and stuff like that is and for your system. Uh, but you can see it basically has a, a risk matrix around um, how likely is something to occur versus how bad is it when it does occur. Um, many of these have been ad adapted into specific applications, specific ones. So automotive has some of the, the strongest safety standards around this because um, automotive is, you know, one of the probably most common embedded systems that has a significant chance of risk to your life. If we look back at this, right, you can imagine the question of multiple loss of life with an automotive system is very easy to imagine because not only do we have a single car, but your your computer is going to be in, you know, hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of vehicles um, in the road that each vehicle could last 10 to 20 or 30, maybe 30 if it's really, you know, if you're really lucky, but at least 10 years. Um, so all of a sudden, you know, if you have a million vehicles, 10 years old, well, that's, yeah, 10 million, right, equivalent years, um, or 10 million vehicle years um, of time. So if you tested one ECU, right, for 10 million years, you could consider it like a, a similar number of hours as all million of those vehicles uh, for 10 years. So this is one of the tricky things about about these is that as we get into more complex systems, right, and systems that are replicated many, many times, all of a sudden we potentially have a lot more test cases than just one or two. Um, uh, the other thing you're gonna come across is this MRSA C. So MRSA C is a um, specification uh, related to automotive standards. Um, and it comes up quite frequently in safety critical, which is the reason I bring it up. Um, and it actually has ideas and, you know, rules around what you can and can't do in your C code. And it's designed to, to improve um, some of the C code by just removing the potential for error. So um, what you have here, for example, this is just one excerpt of it, rule 59, um, say is it tells you that you can't do what I've done at the bottom here, which is it has a, a else statement without brackets around it. And the reason this would be an error, right, is that if I start with this code, this code is actually valid. Um, it, it violates rule 59, but it's valid C code. Um, what I've done at the bottom here, right, is I've added that Z equals one. Let's move the cursor out of the way, sorry. Um, so the Z equals one is no longer part of the else block, right, because the else block did not have brackets around it. Therefore, um, it doesn't include the Z equals one, it just includes the, the Y equals 20. Um, so you can see that's just like a common error that could really easily creep in. Um, so there's a whole series of rules that MRSA C applies. And so if you're designing code in automotive environments, you'd be uh, typically using these rules. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the, the problem with some of them, so these aren't a total, uh, you know, apply these and nothing will go wrong. Um, because it does require you to understand how frequently the errors are in real life. So the Therac 25, the, one of the issues was the designers believed the errors weren't possible. Um, with some of the automotive stuff, right, uh, there was a huge PR campaign, and you can see a lot of that if you try to research some of this, um, to basically convince people that, you know, it had to be the users pressing the wrong pedal. There's no way um, the cars could have done this. It was impossible. And you can see from Michael Barr's presentation, you know, whether or not some users press the wrong pedal, um, the, the code itself was unsafe by any of these basic standards. Um, and basically, 
has the potential for substantial harm, right? So if you look back at the risk matrix um, and you looked at how probable is some of this that it could happen, um, you would probably find out that, you know, hey, this actually shouldn't have passed some of these, these specifications, but uh, people had the incorrect assumption about um, how much likely this was to happen. Um, right, and the final thing is that it's something that's very unlikely if you're just talking about one unit, it's totally different if we're talking about a million units. So if there's a one in a million chance, then it's like, ah, what are the chances that's gonna happen? One in, one in a million chance per year. Um, you know, well, if you have a million units on the road, well, yeah, it's, very, it's almost guaranteed to happen then, or it's very likely to happen um, at some point over that year to one of the units. We don't know which unit, but one of them. Um, and the final thing is what about hardware problems? So you might be thinking purely in perspective of um, a reliable hardware that doesn't itself have faults. So, so that's one of the other issues is that you always need to consider what the actual real probabilities are. Um, the one thing I'll talk about next, so um, because this, this got a little long, I have a, a 104.5, to quickly talk about fuzzing. Um, and the question is how good are your tests, right? Do you just test? So the, the other thing you should always be doing is testing. Um, so one of the real solutions here is to always have aggressive testing, uh, but just testing expected incorrect errors isn't enough. Um, we want to do something called fuzzing. So fuzzing is actually sending incorrect data and seeing what the results are. And this is actually used pretty commonly in security stuff. Um, and I'll go over really briefly how fuzzing works and show you a quick example of that next in 104.5.